So it's a case of uh, compounding interest. When my my oldest son was born, my first son was born, his grand his great grandfather gave him a hundred dollar check. And if he put that hundred dollar check into a savings account at that time, and he lived to be his grand great grandfather's age, that account would have eighty five million dollars in it just from that single hundred dollar check. There's a compounding is just is uh, really unbelievable. But it it really matters more what you do with what you make than how much you make. Welcome millionaires and future millionaires. You're listening to the Millionaires Unveiled podcast, the show where you'll hear the stories and interviews of everyday millionaires. We'll unveil their decisions, their strategies, and their portfolio allocation. Now to your host, Jace Mattinson. Welcome back to another episode of the Millionaires Unveiled podcast. This is episode number 284. Hope everybody's having a great week out there, just swinging into the month of March. A lot of people are probably starting to think about their taxes if they haven't filed already. we got all sorts of deadlines coming up over the next couple of months, either for extensions or getting your filing done. So, yep, it's tax time, folks. One of those favorite things that we do every year in the spring. At any rate, weather's starting to turn for a lot of people, and a lot of, a lot of parts of the country are still uh, getting heavy, heavy snowfall, which hopefully will help with uh, some of the water out west, and water issues and droughts and whatnot. But... Uh, yeah, it's been gorgeous here in Texas. Been enjoying a little bit of the time at the lake and on the golf course. And uh, looks like we're going to have some more warm weather. So super pumped for that. This week we have Roger. He's in his 60s, which we've had a lot of people request getting some more retirees or people that are of retiree age. Roger, I wouldn't consider technically retired as he's still an active investor. But at any rate, he's definitely in that in that category. He's a net worth of $7.2 million. 25% of that is in fixed income and mainly loans that we'll get into the show and, and uh, discuss. And then the 75% of that is in his real estate equity. About $25,000 a month comes in real estate income, and then he's got another 10 to 12 in other uh, fixed income that he considers. So got a pretty healthy monthly income. And then he's got a little bit in cash, 25 grand, 25K and some T-bills, and then 46 grand in the HSA. We discussed his IRS tax audit that he had a while ago. Renting to tenants without ever locking his doors or hiding keys or anything. Pretty crazy. I and mean, we get into a discussion on generational wealth and his take there. So great episode with Roger. Last week we had Lauren. Her net worth was $3.1 million. Spread all sorts of uh, across all sorts of different categories between vacant land, primary residence, car wash development fund, short-term rentals, equity, self-storage facility, and then some traditional retirement accounts between Roth. Uh, 401k HSA and some 529s. A great interview with her. Fit several of you right in recently asking all sorts of questions about the host and myself. And I think we'll take a little bit of time over the next uh, several intros here and there to address some of these. One of these that came in uh, is, is about kind of millionaires travel and millionaires vacations and kind of the mindset there. And, you know, I don't really know how to approach this. We've seen things done all over the board. Obviously, it's one thing that we definitely try to ask. I would say probably upwards of like 95% or more of our millionaires typically value, uh, you know, travel and experiences versus like things, so to speak. Now, we have had a few, you know, that are have cars or watches or certain items, uh, you know, as part of their kind of, I wouldn't even call it portfolio, but things that they have spent money on. Uh, but generally it's, it's really, or, or vacations versus things and experiences versus, th versus things that, uh, they prefer. And I wouldn't say that there's much of a formula for this, uh, other than this is definitely the preference and each millionaire that we've had on, we discuss this a little bit and some are all over the board, whether it's trips to Europe or around and abroad, or whether it's trips to Disney World, Disneyland with their kids, or whether it's just going out in the in the backyard and having a staycation. But at any rate, this is the preference. I was talking to to Brad about this a little bit just in my own personal life because I told him we were probably going to visit California in 2028 or 2032 or something. He's like, how in the heck do you have this planned out? <laughs> I said, well, I said, you know, with, with three kids now, travel is, is not as a – it's not as easy to be spontaneous as it once was. And so what we did, my wife and I kind of put together a schedule. And some of this has to do with certain things that we wanted to have, you know, experience wise at certain ages. 
for our kids or for ourselves. Uh, going back to kind of the the Die with Zero book that I know we've mentioned a few times on the podcast, and and you know Bill Perkins talks about having certain experiences at certain ages that you just can't replicate it at other times in your life. And so we sat down and, and started putting this together more or less of certain places that we wanted to go or that we had never been and or that we wanted to to have our kids experience. And so we put together a big list of, you know, all these different places and kind of segment them by year and tried to kind of fill the gaps like, hey, that makes sense to go there, you know, when our kids are eight and six and four and probably not there when they're not teenagers yet or whatever. And so we got a pretty, pretty extensive list together for the next, I don't know, 15 or 20 years. I'm sure some, some of it's going to be subject to change, but at any rate, it's kind of the plan. And so far it's, uh, I guess we've done it's our second year doing this and, uh, yeah, I've been able to execute it on it so far. And, and one of the things I think that I really like about it is I don't have to think about where to go anymore, uh, you know, on vacation or what to do. Cause we kind of already went through that process, but the other thing is, gosh, you know, I've been looking for knowing that we have this plan out there for four and six months or, you know, four, six, eight, 12 months ahead. It's much easier to find, you know, inexpensive, you know, car rentals and Airbnbs and flights and everything else because I'm not buying them, you know, last minute or anything. So I think we've been able to take advantage of the arbitrage there a little bit and being able to have some of those things planned early. So we'll see if it, uh, if we can uh, make it work and continue to execute on it. But 2028 is partly because the Olympics are going to be in LA and I've, I've always wanted to go to the Olympics. So that's uh, kind of the gist between what we've done and then, you know, and travel with our, with our millionaires and what they've done, but definitely try to uh, start asking that a little bit more. We've had a, several requests around that and, and just getting into the mindset around experiences and travel and intentionality and that. So we'll definitely start to ask some, some more questions around that. Once again, if you'd like to be on the show, send us an email, millionairesunveiled at gmail.com. We've got some several great episodes coming up. Uh, still looking for that 300th. However, we do have a pretty good lead on that right now. So hopefully we'll be able to uh, deliver that here in a few weeks, I guess about 14, 14, 15 weeks here before we drop that episode. But uh, at any rate, I uh, would definitely love to uh, get some more millionaires on the podcast. So if you're interested, send us an email and uh, we'll get you scheduled and go from there. Without any further delay, let's get into the interview with Roger. Roger, do you want to just give us a little about your background and what you're up to now? I have a grandchild number 17 being born next month. I've been married 14 years. My first marriage, uh, my first wife passed away from cancer uh, after 39 years of marriage. Uh, I had four kids at home and uh, I lived in Oregon. So it was, uh, I didn't want to bring anybody through the doors. My youngest was 11. So I was trying to process what I was going through. And uh, in that in that series, I met my wife who was in uh, uh, Granada Hills. And that's where I live now. Awesome. And what is your net worth today? Uh, about 7.2 million. Holy cow. And what's the breakup of that 7.2? Uh, 25% is fixed income and 75% is equities. Um, when you think equities, that would be uh, equities in properties. I have uh, 30 real estate properties. They're all paid for. And I have uh, 1.8 million in fixed income. Those are uh, either first mortgage loans or just loans to uh, a business or loans to a friend. Um, the, the income from the fixed income is... Uh, 12,000 a month, and it's earning about 8% over the five or six different uh, loans. And the equities would be the properties. They're generating 23,000 a month. That's before uh, HOA fees and uh, in, uh, taxes and things like that. And then I have uh, 25,000 in cash, 20,000 in T-bills, because they have those are I-bonds, and uh, 46,000 in an HSA, pretty much what it is. When did you start that HSA? Um, when I decided to retire at 62 and take Social Security, I thought I will take the Social Security and I'll put it into an HSA instead of spending it. So it's uh, it wasn't taxable to me. It was a tax deduction. It grows tax free when I take it out. So when I was 62, that would be uh, five years ago, five and a half years ago. So. And you started pulling on Social Security five years ago as well. 
I did. Yeah. I looked at the charts to how much you were going to get when you were, if you waited until you were 65 or 66 or 70, and I figured I could generate additional income and I am now making more now that I'm 67. I'm making more than I would have had I waited. Plus, I've got the uh, almost uh, 100,000 in in uh, lump sum that I wouldn't have if I waited on a Social Security. So I want to back up because we were talking a little bit before and obviously with, with some conversations that, that we were having in, in your intake form. Let's back up here a little bit. Your net worth is not really indicative of what you've done, where you've been in life. So just for our listeners, will you back up? Where did Roger start? What did Roger start making? Obviously, you're in your late 60s now and retirement age and, and real unique for us on the show. But back, you know, take us back to, to the early days of how this all got started. Um, we got married at age 23. We had uh, no, we had three thousand dollars in savings. That was about, that was our net worth at the time. I had a ten-year college loan, um, so I suppose if you take the loan, then I wouldn't have any net worth. We wouldn't have any net worth. Um, but we decided when we got married, we would take ten percent of whatever we made, to, uh, put it, give it to God, ten percent to savings, and then spend the rest. So. Uh, we started saving 10% ever since we uh, we got married. That was uh, 1977. I worked for uh, an insurance company uh, for three years. I sat in hundreds of homes, and it seemed like the more the people made, the more in debt they'd have. People would say, oh, if I just made a little bit more, I'd be able to pay off these loans, and I'd, the next appointment would be somebody who would be, be making that amount, and they would say the same thing, and they, they'd have uh, a, a worse situation. So they just had a lot of debt, and I thought, you know, what these people need is savings. They don't need to spend it. So I went to the local bank and I said, I want to sell your savings accounts out to the general public because they need savings. They don't, I, I have experience selling insurance. They don't need an insurance. They need a savings plan. And you know what the bank said? We don't have a position like that, except maybe as a branch manager, you could do that. So they hired me as a, a branch manager trainee and I worked for the bank for five years they uh, so we say we save 10 percent. If if you spend 10 percent more than you make every month, every year, you're going to fall into a deep hole. If you save it, you're you're just going to that hole is going to be reversed. You're going to climb the mountain. And uh, so we we, I, we were probably I think I mentioned uh, before we before we talked that my income was an average of ten thousand dollars a year over the last 40 years. Uh, the highest 10 years that I made was an average of 22,000. I, I didn't have any investment in real estate until I was 55 when I uh, bought a house for my stepdaughter to live in. And I saw that it was such a much better uh, return than the bank. My, the wife that I had married owned a property in Georgia that, w that she paid 140,000. It was now worth 70. So she, it was worth half the amount. And everybody on the street was walking away from them. And oh. uh, so I, I asked the bank if they would do a, a, a whatever you call one of those, you know, change the terms of it. And they reduced the interest rate from eight and a quarter to eight percent, which was which was nothing. So I paid off that house and I bought four more houses on that street for 68,000, 70,000. They're now worth uh, over 200,000. So R Roger, obviously this this is a story about saving, right? Like you you've made it a discipline from a early age to to just save, right? You could simple. What's interesting to me is you didn't buy your first real estate property until you were in your 50s, right? Real, real estate investment property. Real estate investment. Our our primary home was uh, the first one we bought. We, it was the cheapest house in the multiple listing book. It was fifty-two thousand, and uh, when we sold that house in in uh, nineteen eighty-six and moved to Oregon, we could, we sold it for what the most expensive house was in the multiple listing. We sold it for three hundred and fifty thousand. So there, even though my my income was not great, the return on some of the properties. We bought. I, we bought that property for. We bought a property in Oregon for 150 thousand. When my wife passed, it was over a million. Uh, we bought a house uh, in Arizona for uh, 210 thousand, and it was worth 500 and a quarter when she passed. And if you, know, if you know anything about a step up in basis, I then rented out those two properties and was able to uh, depreciate them 
and uh, that that took a lot of uh, uh, income away from other real estate that we owned. If that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. So basically, a lot of your early wealth came from appreciation in your in your main assets. Definitely. Yeah. 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 And then and then once you got to the point where you know you could you couldn't do much more with your primary home. That's when you started to invest. My my idea of investing was providing a home for my daughter-in-law. It wasn't like, oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, get a good return on this. It was just helping somebody out. So and and the properties in in uh, Georgia on that street we bought, it was like because the experience I had with the return from the uh, rental for my daughter-in-law that encouraged me to purchase other real estate properties. Um, and the and the returns were probably 20%, 25% cash on cash return. Um, I, I chose Georgia because I could buy a house there for 30,000. They're renting for 900 a month. You couldn't do that here in California. Definitely not, and definitely not today. That's right. We're neighbors, sort of, and uh, we both know California for sure. Yeah. Well, I, Jace, I have to say, I think, you know, as a longtime fan of the show, and now I'm new, new to uh, helping you co-host the show. I think Roger's your first double millionaire because he's got uh, both millionaire and wealth, but he's also got a uh, 17 grandkids. <laughs> yeah, that's man, that's pretty uh, interest. That's right. That is very true. I don't think we've had a, uh, we've had that kind of representation on the show. So Roger, I want to, I want to just back up here to, to make sure we get a, a couple of these details filled in here. So you're you're working in insurance. At what age do you walk away from call it a traditional W two job? Thirty two. So you're thirty two years old, and that's it. And at that point, you were living on savings, and you stayed home with the kids, and your wife did too. Is that correct? No. Um. At at uh, I was in charge of a of a branch of the bank. Normally, we think of a bank branch. You walk in, and they're tellers, and they're new accounts people, and there's a branch manager. Um, I started a branch at the bank on a card table with two telephones, and in three years we brought in three hundred million dollars. So it was a, a sort of a money desk for the branch. Um, when you go to a bank, you think, "Oh, this bank pays X percent interest." Actually, the same bank will pay a different interest rate. They may pay seven different interest rates for the same dollar amount in the same term. And so we would negotiate rates. We would bring in money from all over the country. We would bring in, at that time, there was a $100,000 maximum for insurance. Um, we would bring in money, not only for our bank, but we would co-broker and broker um, CDs to other banks. I think we were the only bank that did that. In fact, my my boss at the time came to me and said, I just got a job at another uh, bank and they hired me because of your department. What is it that you do? So we were sort of a, a, an offshoot shoot, uh, of, of the regular banking parameters. When I left the bank, I started a co-broker uh, company. It was called Rate Finder Services. And I put an ad in the local paper, it was $40, and it would have the interest rates of the highest banks in the, in the US. And uh, I had so many calls before uh, lunch, I'd, I couldn't even get dressed. And that ad ran for one month and it generated so much interest that I didn't have to advertise or call out or do anything. I just would handle the customers that came in through that ad. I would work about 10 minutes a day. I'd call up the, my customer. I'd say, this is what the rate is. They'd say, renew it. And I'd say, and I'd call the bank and renew it. So it was, it was, uh, n there wasn't a lot of work there from 1996 until uh, 1986 until 1990 about when interest rates really went down in a hole and the co-brokering business really disappeared. So, so the, the years in your 30s, you were you were doing the bank and the brokerage all together, but you were also home a lot. Is that correct? I was home a lot. Yep, home a lot. And then after after that, or, or I guess, did you do that for the rest of your your traditional career? I stayed home all, all my career. In fact, uh, we homeschooled our kids. My wife didn't work outside the home. I would run the large group meetings for homeschooling families. We had about 85 homeschooling families in the area. Uh, I would send out a newsletter and uh, run the large group meetings. And some of the dads would want to stay home like I was doing, and they'd come over to uh, to, see, to shadow me, to see what I did. To, so that maybe they could do that. But um, I think the, the w one of the challenges is 
that if you focus on helping other people, it's like when, when people said, what, what do you do for a living? My friends would lean in and listen because they didn't know what I did for a living. And my job was sort of to meet the needs of the people that God brought to me. And it, it was God's job to take care of my needs. So I don't do anything for money. I don't work for money. Uh, the money will happen if you use your skills and abilities to do what you're gifted in. And the people that would come over and shout on me, what they were interested in was how could they make money? And if you have a focus on that, you you lose the focus on trying to help people. So those those years that you're you're working from home, you're I mean, before working from home is popular. Those were the years that you're making twenty to forty thousand dollars. No, no, no. When I brought in. Uh, when I worked for the bank, that was my highest income because they would pay us a commission for the, all the money that we brought in. In fact, I was making more than the person, the senior executive vice president, they had 800 employees. And uh, the bank was trying to think of some way they could reduce our, our salary. And if you know how banks work, they work, they move very slowly. So they said, well, instead of paying them for the money they bring in, let's pay them based on how much money they have. So we had brought in all this money and now they changed it and they paid us even more because of the money that we had on on hand already. So it, it didn't make a lot of sense, but it was helpful for us. So that was those were the years I was uh, a, the, a manager of the of the uh, department of the money desk. And uh, one morning uh, I went in and they said they were going to have somebody else be the manager. And I said, if you do that, I'm going to leave. And they said, have a nice trip. So in in the course of one day. I had no idea that I was going to leave and and uh, that was probably the best thing that ever happened because it allowed me to be on my own and be with my family and kids. Wow. And how much did you live on during that period when you were with home, at home and working with with your kids? The um, our, I went through a um, Jim Salmon's co- lecture uh, called financial F- financial freedom, and uh, they encourage you to pay off your get out of debt, pay off all your mortgages. And um, so we did not have a mortgage on the house. We had uh, our, our expenses were $1,000 a month. Um, our insurance premium for myself, my wife, my five kids was $99 a month. It wasn't we, uh, we, we didn't, because we were home all the time, there wasn't any need for a vacation at from work. So we, I suppose we didn't take vacations. I really didn't take a vacation until after my second marriage. So and you, uh, and you never wanted a vacation from each other. OK, so my, <laughs> wife, my wife says this is a vacation. Take the five kids and go someplace. <laughs> so <laughs> so I would take the five kids and, and visit my mom and uh, and she'd get a vacation. She'd get a break. So yeah, yeah, we, I get, I we get home- sent down the hill all the time take yeah, we, the kids and leave me alone. That's great. No, yeah, we we homeschooled. So the kids were there uh, all the time. It was a, it was a great experience. We loved homeschooling. It was it was uh, fantastic. I, I did teach public school for one year in 1976. So I know what it's like having 30 kids in the class, six classes a day. And when you have just five kids and you're teaching them, you can get their learning style. You can teach them. There's no ceiling. You can go do whatever you want. One of my kids got a perfect score in the SAT. One of them, uh, I think he was uh, 17. We went to the local college and uh, they, he told them what he was doing. And they said, boy, I don't have any any program that that even matches what you're doing. So they uh, they they really excelled. One of my kids was uh, he learned how to play chess. He was a five time state champion. He went to as a sophomore. He was the high school national chess champion. Uh, so, Roger, I want to ask, as you're going through this, you still were saving money, but you were just putting it into a bank account, right? That had a nominal interest That's rate. Right. That, OK. Yeah. That's right. Um, what I found when I sat down with people, when I was selling insurance in the hundreds of homes, what I found was people would have a put and take savings account. They would build up their savings and then they would spend it. They would go on a vacation. They would buy a boat. They would do something and then they would go back. And they, it was just a put and take, put and take. And what I realized what they needed was a put and keep savings account. So this 10 percent that we saved if we needed the money, we would borrow it from the 10%. We would borrow it from ourselves, and then we would pay it back. So it's a case of uh, compounding interest. When my my oldest son was born, my first son was born, his grand his great grandfather gave him a hundred dollar check. And if he put that hundred dollar check into a savings account at that time, and he lived to be his grand great grandfather's age, that account would have 85 million dollars in it. 
just from that single hundred dollar check. There's a compounding is just is uh, really unbelievable. Over the years, we I've just put money into the IRA account. I had no other investments, no stocks, no bonds, uh, no real estate other than the home we lived in. And then uh, in 19 uh, uh, in 2010 or 11, when the when the real estate market fell, dropped like a rock. That's when I took the money out of the savings account and purchased uh, properties. And at that point, how much did you built up into that savings account? In the IRA account, the IRA account now has 11 real estate properties. Uh, and the, the, uh, the IRA account had 360,000 that, that those IRA accounts are now two, let's see, they're now 2. Uh, 2.5 million in the, the IRA accounts. I have a million and a half in my Roth account that's generating $10,000 a month, and it's going right back into the Roth account. And how did that Roth account come about? In 1998 or 99, they came out with the Roth, and I took the entire amount that I had in my uh, traditional account, and I put it over into my Roth account. Uh, At that time, they had four-year, three-year forward averaging. And so uh, during those uh, three or four years, um, that was when we we were we had low income. We had I left the bank and uh, converted everything to a Roth. And then I just put money into the Roth account for the next, I don't know, last 20 years. So um, So you maxed that account for the last 20 years. I've I've maxed out my my IRA accounts ever since I was 23, ever since I started working. Uh, It was fifteen hundred dollars a year and then it was two thousand and it was. And, it, and it's gone up when it was uh, 7,000, 6,000, uh, I'd still max it out. But you never invested in anything in the public market? Never. Oh, well, I did. Um, in 2009, in April, I put uh, $65,000 into the stock market. And I bought GE and Bank of America and Citicorp, uh, companies that had really fallen down. And then the next month it went up a thousand dollars and I sold it all. <laughs> and I realized this isn't a good idea. Buying real estate, uh, if it goes up a thousand, you can't sell it. So I, that's when it, it's another good reason to put money in real estate. You, you can't uh, get out of it very quickly. So uh, how did you know, Roger, like uh, when the broth became a, a new product, essentially, how did you know about the products? Like, how did you keep apprised of the product, and how did you know that it was a good good decision at that time? Um, that's a good question. Uh, my wife at the time, the one that that I was married to for 29 years, her parents were rather wealthy. They had uh, um, maybe 10 million, and I knew that when they passed, we would have the money from uh, from her parents. Um, she had a say, uh, one other brother. Uh, and so I knew that I should put my money into uh, a Roth account so it wouldn't be taxed on top of what she would we would be receiving, if that makes sense. I mean, that's it, absolutely it, so um, I put as much money as I could into a Roth. I just I wanted to keep it so that when the funds came from the, her parents, that there wouldn't be a high tax bracket on top of everything else. As it happened, she passed before her parents passed. So. I didn't get any uh, any inheritance from her parents, but what I did get was a large amount of Roth income. You're at seven million now, so that, if you would have gotten a ten million dollar inheritance, oh. you're a pretty bad investor. But that, that makes sense. yeah. My wife, my second wife, uh, did work outside the home, and she um, uh, when we got married, she was about a uh, hundred thousand dollars underwater as far as her net worth. The home that she lived in, that we live in now, was underwater. Uh, she had bought one property in Georgia, and she had paid 140,000. It was worth 70, so it was it had lost half its value. So I, I paid off the house that she had in Georgia. I paid off the house that we lived in here, and uh, I bought four more houses using my IRA money uh, in Georgia. Um, and all that income from the IRA money from the from the uh, rental properties would go back into my IRA account. And it would generally, when it would build up, I'd buy another property. And then after 30 properties, I thought, well, I've got one for each day of the month, so I'll do something else with it. And that's why um, I've got 1.8 million that I'm 
have been loans to uh, friends and companies that are paying the 8%, 10% on it. Roger, how much do you live on now? It's interesting because uh, when we I got married the second time in 2009, um, we, we were going to, uh, my wife's money would go directly to our, our son's, uh, my stepson's uh, college. Uh, so he wouldn't have any college debt when he got out. Um, and so, and when he was graduated from college, then she was going to retire. She retired at 55, I think. Uh, and so um, I would take one month every year and I would write down everything we spent. And it was like, oh my goodness, it was like 10000 a month. And that's another reason that I bought real estate was because I needed to have some some additional income or I was going to drain every, anything that I had. She was making, when I say 10000 a month, that doesn't include the that includes the four thousand month we put into savings. We we maxed out her four hundred one k and her IRAs, and and uh, so there was a lot of a lot of money that went into savings. So it wasn't like eleven thousand out the door. But she was making forty thousand and sort of living on that forty thousand. So I would say that the last ten years we we uh, spent forty thousand. My my youngest daughter and her youngest son were the same age. They went and and her son would go and. Uh, without with his friends and he was always asking for additional money and my daughter would never uh, ask for money and i asked her one time why is it that you're not um needing money because you're going out with your friends and she said i'm saving it for my grandchildren and this is when she was a sophomore in high school so somehow i was able to instill in my kids a generational concept and i think and i see that in the in the the, 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 the four kids that I have, they are all multimillionaires now, not just because uh, the grandparents passed, but because they have have an attitude of taking care of the future and looking for their kids. You should know what that is. That's the best kind of notification. That's the sound of another sale on Shopify. And the moment another business dream reality comes true. Shopify is the e-commerce platform revolutionizing millions of businesses worldwide. In fact, I use it for several businesses that I have and my wife has. We love Shopify. Shopify simplifies selling online and you can focus successfully growing your business. Shopify covers every sales channel from in-person POS system to all-in-one e-commerce and it even lets you sell across social media marketplaces like TikTok, Facebook, and Instagram. Hacked with industry-leading tools ready to ignite your growth, Shopify gives you the comfort of your business and your brand without having to learn new skills or design new code. And thanks to 24-7 help and an extensive business course library, Shopify is, is there to help you have success every step of the way. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash unveil lowercase. Go to shopify.com slash unveiled to take your business to the next level. Once again, that's shopify.com slash unveiled. And thanks again to Shopify for sponsoring today's episode. At what age did you become a millionaire? You know, I I would write down my net worth uh, ever since 2000, uh, ever since 1977 when we got married. So I was looking for those papers uh, and I, I don't think I don't think they exist anymore. Um, but it was probably, <laughs> it was probably we we owned a house in in uh, Corvallis that was maybe eight hundred thousand, and we had a house in Arizona that was five hundred thousand. That was in the year two thousand. So I would think probably the mid forties. I I didn't I, because I worked for a bank. My grandmother uh, wanted to um, give money to her grandkids, but she wanted it to go for their education. So she didn't want to just give it to them. So she gave it to me to manage. And then I would put it into bank accounts and disperse it to the children as they needed it for their education. And, uh, at the time there were about a dozen grandchildren that I would disperse it for. Uh, that was in 1980. And over the next, these last 40 years, I've had 30 family members give me their money and I put it into bank CDs because they can get 4% and it's available to them at any time. It's all federally insured. It's, it's sort of like a, we call it the family fund account. So it's in my name. I send them out a 1099 and uh, I file a 1086 to the government. So I, I have a lot of interest income in my name, but it goes back out to all my uh, my relatives. So there were millions of dollars that I would invest in CDs. And because they were government insured, you don't need a license to do that. What you need is trust in your family so that they would give you their money. 
So I, mean, I don't know if any of my 30 family members, I would say, here, here's all my money and manage it for me and send me a, a, a monthly statement. I've done that for 40 years. I continue to do it today. I don't, and I don't charge them any fees to do that. It's sort of yeah. nice, sort of nice because I can put my money in that uh, conglomerate. I, I wrote a, a program back in the, in the eighties, early eighties, uh, that was on a cassette tape that would figure out how much interest everybody got. And uh, so I, when I looked at it, I'm sort of taking care. I'm a caretaker for their money and I'm taking a caretaker for my own money. So it was easier not just to think, oh, I've got this money. What am I going to do with it? I was uh, investing for my family. So where do you go from here? So I see my job as being a good steward of what I have. And so I don't consider that any of the money that I have belongs to me. When my wife passed in uh, 2007, I, w- I was in the room when she passed and it's like, there's a real difference between the temporal and the eternal. And all this money we're talking about, it means nothing. I mean, there's there's a, a, a verse that goes, for what shall a profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Gaining the whole world is a little bit more than a millionaire. What's most important is that is that uh, eternal part. So what goes on from here is focusing on that eternal, teaching my kids uh, the value of of relationship and family heritage, sort of loving others. I I have uh, these 30 rentals in Georgia. I have never been to Georgia. I bought them sight unseen. I manage all. If somebody leaves, I say, leave the door unlocked and the key under the sink. If somebody's interested, I say, the door is unlocked. If you like it, the key's under the sink. I've never done a credit check on any of my tenants. I've only had one eviction in the last 10 years. I I consider them uh, to be friends. I love my tenants. Um, at one time, my daughter read it for me, and I want to treat all my tenants just like I would treat my daughter. That's amazing. I wrote down some things that I wanted to cover, and one of them was a tax audit. I got audited in uh, 1986 because I had hundreds of thousands of, of income, and I paid $2,000 of taxes. And uh, they went over every item line by line. They looked at every tree in the forest. They, I had about 11000 of uh of charitable contributions and they wanted to see uh, checks and receipts for everything. And I, I was missing $3 and 50 cents and they wanted to know where that $3 and 50 cents was. We went on to the next area and here was a $3 and 50 cents uh, receipt from the the red cross that, uh, that matched that up. I mean, they looked at every, every hair on my tax return, every number. And at the end they owed me another thousand dollars. So I haven't been audited since I do. I do help people with their taxes. I haven't paid uh, income tax probably in the last uh, 18, 20 years, I think, because the way that real estate works, you get to deduct the depreciation and that just takes away from what the, the income you have. Putting money into the Roth account. I think last year I had 440, uh, last year I had $446,000 of gross income. Uh, and the tax return I had was uh, twenty thousand dollars, and and that was not that was my income. I paid no taxes. That was what happened with the with the uh, after all the deductions. Wow, it, it is wild. This, I, I mean, I can't believe it. My my family says, how can you have uh, four hundred thousand of income and then pay no taxes on it? But yeah, if you yeah. if you understand the tax laws. It, it really does help. Um, and I understand when I went to the audit, the uh, the tax guy would come with his big book and he'd say, you can't have that deduction. And he would show me the page in his book. I took the book. I turned the page. I says, and here it says that I can have the deduction. So it really helps to understand what the tax laws are. I, I sort of have a, a gifting in financial uh, understanding and investments. Yeah, for sure. So to wrap up here, let's uh, let's move to some rapid fire questions. What's the uh, most expensive meal out that you paid for? Prior to um, my second marriage, it was a uh, there were thirty some people at a rehearsal dinner for my son's wedding. I think it was three hundred and forty dollars. Then I married my wife. She went out with her mother and I and her sister, and I think it was four hundred and fifty dollars. So it. it uh, the, the most expensive one was a $450 meal. Nice. What about the most expensive car that you purchased? I have three cars and a motorcycle. Uh, the total investment I have in all those uh, vehicles is less than $10,000. Wow. 
The most expensive car was a BMW uh, 325i convertible. I think I have $200 into that car. So when you talk about purchasing a vehicle, mm, not so much. My wife did have a, a car loan when I married her and I paid off the car loan that was 14,000. So that's the most I've ever paid for a car by paying off the car that she had. I replaced that car with a car I paid $2,000 for. You know, the blue book was 14,000. Wow. If you were to be a college professor, what course would you teach? I did teach college. I taught photography. Um, I love photography. So that's, that's, that was, that's easy. And, when, did, and, when did you teach college? We just keep um, learning about all these professions you've had. Uh, I, I, I didn't tell you some of the other professions. It would take too long. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I uh, taught, taught, taught college in 1976. I would teach public school during the day. In the evening, I would teach uh, at the local, the local college. And the, the college kids would learn more in one evening than the whole semester that the junior high kids would learn. So it's amazing when you're ready to learn uh, and you want to learn how much you can learn. What are some of the mistakes that you've made along the way that you would caution others against? I would say um, the the put and take savings account. Be serious about putting money in and keeping it there, investing and not touching it. So many people will, will say, yeah, I'm saving money. And then they'll use that money that they saved and they don't have a long term perspective. And it's uh, the the idea of spend less than you make. What a concept. I, I listen to a lot of financial um, broadcasts and they all say, well, we're not giving investment advice. This is just for education and entertainment. Well, here's some investment advice. Spend less than you make. Okay. What, what's been the range of, of your household income again for your working life? Now, when my son was six months old, he was in a higher tax bracket than I was. So if we're, if we're looking at taxable income, the uh, I, I probably had, I'm looking at one, two, three, four, five, probably had uh, 20 years of no taxable income. And uh, my highest taxable income was in 1986, I think it was 65,000. Wow. When I, when I wrote the letter to you and I said it was 45, that was the limit at that time, how much social security um would tax you on, but my income was 65. The next year it went from 65 down to zero and it was zero for the next four or five years. Wow. But it it really matters more what you do with what you make than how much you make. Any last words of advice that, that you would give somebody who's just beginning or starting out on their journey? The people that you that you associate with, that you, you make friends with, it's important that um, you you have good friends. Um, I, I think that, you know, bad company corrupts good morals, something like that. Just choose to be a good friend and have positive people that would encourage you. And I've, I've listened to, uh, probably close to 200 of your interviewers and I'm listening to them as would I want to sit down with this fellow or this lady and, uh, and be friends with them. And some of them, boy, there would be nothing I would love better than to spend in, uh, a week on a vacation talking with them. And then there's some that says, I'm thinking, hmm, okay, <laughs> I'm looking for the next episode. because, <laughs> <laughs> And I love the way what, what you're doing, Chase, because you never criticize any of these people. I've never heard once when there was many opportunities to say what you're doing is wrong or what you did is wrong. You're just asking questions. And I love that about you. So yeah, thanks. keep up the good work. Thanks. One one bonus question, real quick, that I was just kind of rehashing in my mind as as we've gone through this episode with you. The the money that you've made from selling some of the properties over the years, do you know the total of that that you've been able to kind of roll and and not have to pay taxes on, and been able to kind of bankroll some of this other, you know, some of these other investments? Uh, when my wife passed in two thousand seven, that was right at the top of the market. So when I sold the properties, there was a uh, there was a tax loss carry forward on those because they became investment properties. So I had uh, probably half a million dollars that I could write off on taxes and I could put that money into uh, into real estate. But um, this is an, an interesting thing. My what's my best investment? 
I bought a half acre for $2,000. Uh, I went down the street and got a $25,000 uh, title insurance policy on it. About five years later, my neighbor said he wanted to use the well on the property. I said he couldn't. He said he had a right to it. I went to my title policy. They had to pay me $25,000. It took him years to pay me the $25,000 because they didn't see the well on it. And then I said, well, where's my interest on this 25,000? And so they had to pay me another 5,000. So I bought it for 2,000. The insured title company paid me 30,000 and it's currently worth 250,000. Wow. So um, and that's just a, a piece of bare land that uh, my property taxes on that are $200 a month. Oh. So oh, five, oh. 500 grand on, on the one that you sold, but you also sold a couple others, right? One in Arizona and then yeah. one in- Yeah, one in, uh, somebody called me, a lot of my tenants will call me and they say, I'd like to buy the property you're renting to me. And I say, well, you know, all I'm going to do is just having to take that money and buy another one. So it's better off if you just buy your own property. But there was a dream I've always had to have a place on the Oregon coast. And I I bought a, a half acre on the Oregon coast. It's 900 feet from the beach. It a, has 100 feet of lakefront. It's surrounded by trees, just an ideal place. And when escrow closed, 10 minutes later, somebody in Georgia called me and said, I want to buy the house. And I thought, oh, well, I'll, I'll do this. I'll sell the house to him and I'll use that money to, to build um, on a house on the beach. That I bought the property for 17000 at the beach. That was two years ago. Today, the, the assessor says it's worth 138000 So I have a, I have a, a request to, to change the property value so my taxes don't go up five times what they used to be. <laughs> Okay. No but the uh, the property that we sold in Georgia just happened to be the one that my wife bought. She bought it for 140,000. And and then when I got married her it was worth 70. When I sold it uh 2 years ago, I sold it for 175,000 and they're paying uh a 30 year amortization in 50, in 10 years they'll pay a lump sum and that lump sum will be the amount that I paid the 130 Hundred and thirty thousand when I bought the when uh, I paid off a loan on it. Wow, so, awesome! Let's so. walk, Roger. What's the net worth of seven point two million dollars? Thanks for coming to the show today. Okay, L- last year it was six point two million. The year before that it was five point two million. So it's going up a million dollars a year. Wow! And uh, ten now, years that ago, goes show, that goes goes to show the power of compounded interest, right? It and the idea of don't put your money just in a bank account because you're never going to get it in a bank account, but have it in some type of equity where it goes up. And I get a, I'm getting an eight percent return on my fixed income, five percent on my equities, but the equities go up. So yeah, um, yeah. What were you about to say? Ten years ago, it was what now? Uh, two million. Two million. Two million. Yeah. Wow. So good for you, man. Appreciate you coming on the show. Thank you. Have a good day and God Great bless you, Roger. Okay. Thank you, Brad. Thanks for listening to the Millionaires Unveiled podcast with Jace Mattinson. For more stories, investment opportunities, and information, check out our website, millionairesunveiled.com. See you next time when you'll hear from another everyday millionaire.